Okay, so this short video is my summary of learning. And uh, the first part is providing an overview of your learning through the project and the program. Well, we started in July of 2019. And from there, I was learning remotely here and uh, video conferencing to Victoria. And so I found that the breakout sessions worked out really well for me and having those small group conversations. Um, it was a bit of a learning curve to kind of just speak up or speak out where you're kind of uh, learning remotely. And then we also had like a, a cohort within the classroom. But I think that was sort of something that I had to deal with is just bringing up my own self-confidence and just getting used to the technology. Um, and it's also kind of just that that modeling of multimedia learning environments helped me sort of grow as what I wanted to do with my project. So I really kind of just seen that model for us as educators and then looking at ways that I could apply that in, in my own classroom and my own project. Uh, the building relationship with peers, I was really surprised about how I was able to build up those relationships and those occurred more so when I had those small group conversations in the breakout sessions and I was able to kind of build the relationships, uh, relationships better with those people who are outside of um, my area. I also enjoyed the guest speakers and the learning opportunities. The blog reflections really helped sort of cement some of my learning and some of the, uh, the things that I heard and doing a little bit more research and finding out for myself about how it relates to me. And then the bigger pieces here is like just the project itself about how to <laughs> how to read the literature and that that took some time after not being in school for you know over a decade hey uh, and also just acquiring that that new knowledge and the new vocabulary to kind of process that information over time the more you read the better you get at it and then of course the uh, researching the literature the writing part um, the application of everything and I also found too is when it came to some of these pieces, um, I know that I have my weaknesses and so I was able to kind of just reach out and talk to other people and get help and support from the peers in my class. And so that was that made a really big difference to help me um, complete this Masters of Education program. So the reflection of growth, I know that there's going to be some parallels and stuff. Um, I'm trying to, um, when talking to you, I want to increase my social presence and so I'm just streaming everything however I say it and I'm kind of just going through it in point form as, as I talk to you. So describe and explain the implications of your research on yourself, your practice and the field. So I'm breaking this down with talking about myself first. So I feel very proud about what I completed. And again, using that group mentality about not always being alone. And I feel that I have this new energy, this growth mindset where I can kind of propel myself forward, but also I can support others around me too from acquiring new skills. And those skills are not only the use of technology, but also just like those research approaches and also being able to identify like the, the philosophy behind a lot of the um, the practices that bring momentum to bring things forward and to kind of justify what my practices are in that way. And again, I really like those breakout sessions. Uh, so my practice, I found that I'm using more first people, people's principles of learning and incorporating those into the content. I think that's really important. It's this whole idea of decolonizing education and also about truth and reconciliation and bringing that forward. So it doesn't necessarily have to include like a social studies class. It can be in any class where you can do this. And I think that uh, for me, bringing more of that content in as sort of like a methodical pr approach about how you can actually apply those first people's principles of learning with the content and delivering content. I also found that I took more time to speak to Indigenous knowledge holders in our school and I think really sitting down and having lengthier conversations and finding out well their background and their skills and then trying to find a bridge to bring those skills into my class. 
I think that's really important instead of like just going up and saying, hey, I want to do this. It's just to find out, well, find, have that conversation and find out what their strengths and their experiences and their stories and then find a way to kind of bring those into the classroom. Um, another one, being an advocate for the use of video conferencing in classes and supporting colleagues. So uh, I was able to get a lot of the, the resources that I needed and I had a very supportive admin staff, but I also communicated some of those things that I was doing in my classroom to kind of bring things forward about what I thought that were really exciting and different and and rewarding and to try and share that information with other people around me. So it isn't just like this one person thing, it's sort of like a group thing and moving forward in that way. So taking more of a leadership, I believe, in this, this field that I looked at. Uh, for the next one, Make explicit connections between the research and findings from the literature review uh, to learn context. So I think from, like I said earlier, just that modeling of multi-access learning framework, which is from Irvine and all, which of course is one of um, the professors um, in our program, Valerie. And I found that having that modeling really helped me sort of see how I could actually bring possibilities with that into my class. So prior to doing my project, I had to come up with a plan because of COVID, how am I going to kind of continue with this project if the school closes, right? And that was a real possibility. So having this, this sort of open mindset and being flexible and being able to pivot and say, okay, well, if this doesn't work out, so I can actually use this multi-access learning framework to actually bring students in remotely and still kind of continue the same thing. But also my literature to kind of keep that open, that little seed there to say, hey, this might happen and, you know, I can actually then move forward and kind of continue with my project. Um, so I also found Kruka and Carino 10 suggestions for video conferencing, super supportive. Uh, so I actually included that like from steps one to 10 and I actually put down all the different things that I was doing in the classroom using those guidelines. And also the first people's principles of learning and connecting that with the, the BC Ministry of Education curriculum and also incorporating that into the student students' activities as well. I also found like Lav and, and Wanger's uh, uh, community of practice. I think I pronounced it wrong, Wanger. Uh, so it, Wanger actually changed his name later. It went to Wanger Trainer, uh, but he kind of reinforced these three points on community of practice, which is that uh, when you have a community of practice, you need to have the glue that binds everyone together. Um, the second is that we need to have engagement to develop those social relationships. And the third is individuals have to be practitioners, uh, share same resources, routines, and the language of learning. And so kind of having that framework as well, thinking about the prior learning in the classroom, bringing in a community of practice, and also uh, having uh, you know, community practice before a video conference session, sort of thinking about all those different elements before you even do a video. And also using first people's principles of learning and to help facilitate community of practice. And I saw that was a really good connection by looking at this theoretical framework um, by applying that. So again, um, looking at how community of practice can be bridged through video conferencing and looking at uh, Cronin and all, uh, he also talked about how it's virtual communities of practice or online communities of practice. So again, looking at some of those researchers and, and just applying into my class. Um, I also feel too, talking about community of practice, um, I thought this is important to, too, was that uh, Shanine Pete had a big impact about my my idea, my framework, and thinking about how when you apply indigenous ways of knowing, it should not always have to be on the indigenous knowledge holders to bring forward that decolonizing of education, that it also has to be 
coming from people like myself who are part of the majority, um, who are, you know, kind of the ones who haven't had the issues with systemic racism and everything else to kind of actually say, hey, you know what, uh, this is something that we all need to do. And it, I, we all need to take ownership to actually bring first people's ways of knowing into the classroom. And so again, I think really bringing some of those, the, like that guest speaker came in and reading up uh, Shani Pete's some of her work and other people's work to help me kind of get into a better uh, mindset moving forward with this project. <clears throat> um, another theoretical framework that I used was the social presence theory. So this was from Short and All um, from 1976. There's also Gunnardina and Little Walther, Parks, Keir and All, Richardson's and All. And really the whole idea, their presence or the premise of social presence theory is how to improve social presence through technology to build that learning satisfaction. Uh, Lowenthal and uh, Mulder gave five strategies improving social presence using communication technology. I found that these strategies also overlapped with Kreka and Carino's 10 suggestions for video conferencing too. But I found like the last point, give students choice when using communication technology. And I thought that was really important. It was also in the literature with Irvine and Dahl as well about actually just using that communication technology, giving students that option. So if there are some learners who don't feel comfortable, say, speaking out loud in the classroom with the mic and with the video set as a kind of panoramic view of the classroom, they can actually use their own electronic device and they can ask questions that way. Now, it was actually pretty interesting that in my findings that I had students who logged in, but none of them asked questions at all. And so <clears throat> that's kind of like something that uh, when it comes to thinking about my future, future research and practice, thinking about where maybe how, how could I have made things better on that front. The next category here to talk about is recommendations for future and practice, which I just talked about, but I'm going to go more in detail here. Um, and the first one is identify where more research is needed. So I felt that the impact of Indigenous knowledge holders on video conference sessions, um, I didn't really have uh, those Indigenous knowledge holders in the video conference sessions. They actually came into my class. So I was very fortunate that I was able to facilitate that. But I think that just the, the, the difference with, say, for example, having an elder communicate and having their culture and their own personal identity communicating in a classroom is going to be, say, someone from a different cultural background. And so I, I didn't find any uh, literature, not very much really about that at all. I, I also wanted to, again, restate about improving engagement of learners through video conferencing. So again, I had students who logged in, um, they didn't text questions in. So it would have been interesting to find out, say, what happens if I had them in pods or groups and then I had one person who is responsible for actually texting things out? And uh, the challenge with that though was because of COVID and the restrictions, I actually had to change my seating plan and I had to create a maximum amount of distance between each of my learners. So that wasn't very conducive. It was something that I wanted to try and explore but again, because of the environment, I wasn't able to kind of uh, move forward in that direction just to kind of see what would occur if I would have had increasing, in, in, an increase in engagement with the learners. Um, another part I found too was having research that has quantitative information about high school engagement with knowledge holders who communicate through video conference. So again, there is a lack of research out there and that would be something to kind of um, look into and possibly maybe we'll see more research about that in the next uh, this year or the following year because of the COVID restrictions a lot of people have had to pivot and they've had to use different strategies to, to communicate with their learners so who knows we'll see what happens and finally I just am going to talk about identify recommendations for policy and practice uh, one of the most important things is making sure that you have simple technology solutions for educators to enable video conferencing. 
Uh, video conferencing can be very expensive. There are some amazing setups that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. But just for like, say, as long as you have the internet connection um, that's reliable, you have like a, an okay, you know, like webcam and having a better mic makes a big difference. You could probably get away with having something quite reliable for, a, you know, $300 or so. Right, so it's very tangible to have something that works out really well. Oh, and one other port part is having that USB extension cord made a huge difference, enabling uh, learners in the back of the classroom to, communi to communicate with everybody. If not, I found that initially when I first didn't have my extended cord, that I just had people who were talking, but they were close to the mic. Um, so that's super important is to make sure that the students have access to the technology in the class. <clears throat> make sure that clear and transparent guidelines that students are able to interact in video conference sessions. So having a school of conduct, having a cyber bullying policy, online cyber bullying, right? Um, and just being really transparent and making sure that the admin knows what you're doing, that you get the approval from the school, and that everybody is on the same page, okay? And also making sure that you have, for example, consent, um, because in my project, my students were 15 years and older. I didn't need parental consent, uh, but you just have to be sort of like really, um, really careful, especially if we have younger learners too. So just making sure that you're following like your um, your school district policies and again your your state or provincial policies too. Uh, and the last one I would like to mention is incorporating first people's principles of learning, which I've kind of been restating I think throughout my my presentation here. And again, um, just having it apply throughout all all classrooms, right? Just the methodology of incorporating first people's principles of learning and kind of getting into a different mindset to kind of move in, into that direction. Okay, so again, I appreciate you listening to the video conference. Uh, so not video conference, my, I guess, uh, my video stream. So thank you very much for everybody who helped help me out and supported my learning, so all the professors at UVic and all the peers and my family. Thank you.